Well, aloha, happy Aloha Friday, everyone. And thank you again for joining us um, for yet another, we're on episode 25, I can't believe it. Uh, we were just, I was just thinking about that. We've been doing this since the beginning of the year. And uh, as many of you who join us every week, I am so grateful that you, that you come and you enjoy us live, but don't feel bad if you're not here for live. Uh, we are also have all of the shows, both the Aloha Friday and the Mentoring Mondays. Um, they are on the BYU Hawaii Ho'okele uh, YouTube channel. You can go and watch them anytime that you would like. So we've had some pretty amazing uh, podcasts over this last six months, I would say. And we want to really connect with the alumni, tell the stories, talk story. Our Monday, Mentoring Monday, is more geared towards career services. And so not always, but most of the time we do interview, these students interview people or alumni who have gone out and are in the communities and are working in careers and have advice in their mentoring the students. Because we really believe that that's a huge uh, asset for the students. I, I think I looked up a, a statistic once that a student that has mentoring is twice, 2.1 times more likely to graduate, also go on to having a really great career, knows how to network, and also is willing to give back to their, their school, their university. And so it's really important, um, that mentoring aspect and that connecting with our alumni is just super important. And it's we've got a platform actually that we've been working on um, building up, which is called the Ohana Network. So if you are not on that, I'm gonna go ahead and share real quick the Ohana Network uh, right there. So you can go to Ohana Network, I'm sorry, ohana.byuh.edu. It's kind of like our LinkedIn for connecting the students and alumni. And if you watched our Mentoring Monday this last Monday, you saw that Mustafa is one of our great students that graduated from here. And during the show, it was awesome because he talked about the fact that the reason why he's working at Tesla is because of the networking that he got from here at BYU Hawaii. So um, we're excited about that. So just as we get going on this show, there's several of you that have, have chimed in or called, um, checked in with us and are live. So just make sure that you write in the comments. We'd love to hear where you are watching us from. As always, we love to see where in the world you are. Also, um, if you have anything to say to our guest today, or if you have any questions or any comments, uh, feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat box. We will address them during the show, possibly. And then at the very end, we'll bring all those comments on. So without any further ado, I just wanted to um, thank our guests that are taking some time out of their busy, busy schedule. <laughs> it's been uh, finals and getting grades in and things like that. But we wanna go ahead and bring the walkers in. Uh, welcome, welcome. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, let me just do it, there we go. Great, we wanna welcome Rebecca and Isaiah Walker. You guys um, have quite the history with this university. So we are excited to, <laughs> to share your story with everybody. Um, so go ahead and just kind of tell us whoever wants to start, but tell us uh, where you came from, what brought you here first? Let's start there. I'll go ahead and start. Um, I grew up pretty much here in Laie. Um, my family moved here when I was 11, so Laie Elementary to Kahuku High School. Um, as growing up as a kid and running the streets of Laie, um, my mom worked on campus, so swimming at the BYU pool, um, the game room, 50 cents for an ice, oh, I'm looking old now, I'm sounding old now, but 50 cents for ice cream at the um, Seasider were memories of my childhood of just growing up here. Mm -hmm. um, when I graduated from high school, I Kahuku High School, I tried BYU Provo and it just wasn't the right fit for me. So I gladly came home to BYU Hawaii and um, loved every part of my education here. Um, I enjoy. I worked at many different departments at the Polynesian Cultural Center, from um, 
cleaning the bathrooms in high school to busing tables to dancing in the Tahitian village. I like to say I've worked in almost every department at PCC throughout my like young years. So yeah, I've just kind of grew up right here and have a lot of love for this place. And um, and then, yeah, we'll go into like how we met. I think then we'll get to that part. But that's yeah. where I grew up. That's yeah. So I have a, a quick question about that. So as a youngster, uh, I, I don't know if that's what you call them here, but as, as a as a youth, what did you? What were your thoughts about the university and about the community? I mean, it sounds like you were very involved with a lot of things. But um, did you? I mean, at that time, did you realize the importance of this of this university and the, the mission and vision of it back then? Um, I think the university because my. I think it was more a playground, an extended playground. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as crowded back then, right? Mm -hmm. Like Illinois Street had no cars on it. Mm -hmm. And and so we would even like play football like next to the road because there were no cars there. So to ride your bikes around campus and to be on campus, there just weren't as many people as we kind of have today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I understood the magnitude of the influence BYU Hawaii has had on people. I think that definitely came when I was a student. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to finish off my undergrad education here was because just the first day I went to a class at BYU Hawaii, I was like, this is it. Mm -hmm. um, the diversity of people and um, my the peers I was able to meet from so many different countries, mm -hmm. um, my professors I had while I was a student here, it was, this was the place. Um, if I could mention a professor, I had John Jonathan. Um, John Max Jonathan, Jonathan, what did he teach? <laughs> he taught Pacific Island studies. Mm. Um, he's from the Cook Islands and he was just, his wealth of knowledge was amazing. And Max Stanton was the anthropology professor back then and mm. we just had many good conversations. And it was through my peers and that interaction that I really was like, oh, this place is special. This place is pretty awesome. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you went away and then you said, nah, I want to go back. <laughs> yeah. It didn't take me long. And when I came home, it was like, I met this guy. Uh -oh. This guy? Oh, I'm mean, sorry, it's that way. <laughs> that guy. And uh, yeah, it was just, yeah. Awesome. We'll, we'll get into that story when we, when we do that after. Up to it. Yeah. So, so Isaiah, tell everybody kind of where you, because you grew up on the big island. Yeah. 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 So I was born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, on the east side of, of Big Island, Mokuokeave, and I grew up in a little town called Keokaha, which is like the ocean side of Hilo. And yeah, so then I didn't grow up actually knowing much about BYU Hawaii. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was young, and I was raised by my dad mostly, although my mom was part of my life of you know, of course, as well. But uh, my father was not active in our church. And so, you know, I didn't join the church until I was 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, really at that time, when I was 16 years old, like uh, competitive surfing was kind of my religion. Yeah, you were, you were heavily into that at that time, yeah. Yeah, so that was just, you know, I was very <laughs> active in, uh, in competing. Uh, I mean, when I was 15 and 16, uh, I was sort of the top ranked surfer on the Big Island for my mm -hmm. age group. And then um, I would fly up to Oahu actually pretty regularly to surf in events up here. Uh, I was sponsored by a few different companies that would pay for some of my things, free clothes and surfboards and stuff <laughs> like that. And then, um, so yeah, then I, I, I even was competing on the national level and, and was really active in that. But yeah, some things happened to uh, to me at that time when I was 15, 16. I had a really good friend die in a car accident and made me yeah. sort of thinking of like the, you know, the purpose of life and the hereafter. Uh, that is the question I was going to ask you. What kind of sparked it at that point uh, of you wanting to, to join the church? Well, there, you know, there are a few things. My mom was always a member of the church. Mm -hmm. Uh, my grandparents, uh, it's actually, you know, it's interesting because my Hawaiian, my Hawaiian side is of my family is where, I, you know, I inherited my 
Mormon lineage. So, mm-hmm. so it, it definitely stems from some of the early pioneers in Hawaii that my mom's side of the family joined the church. So she was, you know, my grandfather, my grandparents, my great, great grandparents actually were converts to the church in the, the 1890s. Mm-hmm. Um, Abraham Fernandez, who um, actually he baptized the queen of Hawaii into the church. And wow. so there's there's kind of a heritage there that's kind of cool, but but I was not really privy to that information, nor mm-hmm. did I really care when I was, you know, before I was 15 years old. And um, so, you know, I had some questions about life and stuff and my mom gave me a Book of Mormon and we would go to church occasionally, you know, Mother's Day and Christmas mm-hmm. to make mom happy. But, um, you know, when I started reading the Book of Mormon, uh, I really kind of committed to, mm-hmm. to learning it. And I committed to reading, you know, two chapters every day. And eventually I read the whole thing. I was pretty, I was a pretty tough nut to crack. I didn't really want anybody telling me, you know, what I, what I was, you know, if I had to join the church or not. So um, I took my time. I read the entire Book of Mormon. And through that experience, I, you know, had this conversion. Um, And, and yeah, so I joined, when I joined the church, I was attending seminary and, you know, I ended up, I ended up, getting a scholarship to come to BYU Hawaii when I graduated, which was kind of cool because I didn't, I only attended seminary for like a year and a half and I still graduated with a, (laughs) with a degree, I guess. And then they, you know, I I didn't realize this, but at the graduation, they handed me an envelope saying, Oh, you get, uh, you know, we're offering you tuition to BYU Hawaii. And, and it was a real kind of crossroads moment for me because you know, since I joined the church um, at that time, even even when I was graduating from high school, I still had this kind of idea and this goal to to become a professional surfer. Mm-hmm. And and you know, but through the spirit and prayer and answers to prayers, you know, my direction ended up being education. And yeah. so that was where the Lord was guiding me. So I came to BYU Hawaii, but of course it was convenient because it's I mean right here on the North shore. And so, uh, right, so there you go. It wasn't the a hard sell. Worlds, right? Yeah. It definitely wasn't a hard sell to, to come here and to be able to go to school and, and surf every day. And so, um, yeah, it was a real, let's, let's, real blessing. Let's back up just for a second. How old were you when you first started surfing? Cause that's such a big part of your story, your life. Uh, well, in some ways you could say I was like a baby, right? I, I, <laughs> because my mom would take me to the beach and, uh, you know, roll around in the sand and the wave hits you. And uh, the first time I stood up on a surfboard, I was probably like seven or eight years old. But wow. uh, there's all the process of boogie boarding and body surfing that I was doing from before I could walk, <laughs> probably. But uh, but yeah. So you it, you just you just took it and run with it. Well, you surfed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the passion you got on that. The other thing that you shared with me the other day I thought was really interesting, too, is that you said that when you joined the church, you also took five of your friends, five of your friends joined the church, too? Um, Yeah. So after I joined the church, I had, um, you know, several friends that we, you know, we hung out in sort of our posse that we served a lot together. And and um, so, yeah, I ended up sharing the, you know, my experience of how it impacted me with with several of my friends and you know, it was kind of cool. It, you know, a lot of them started to come to church. And what I loved about Hilo was that, you know, I'd come to church with my friends, like they're wearing like surf shorts and t-shirts mm-hmm. and, you know, because Hilo's real laid back and lots of aloha. In fact, the bishop who uh, at the time was Ali Auna, um, who's also an alumni of BYU Hawaii and uh, has been a general authority also in the church. And so, you know, people like, Ali and and many other you know f- members of the church and Hilo just welcomed us with lots of aloha and you know mm-hmm. not a lot of judgment and so it was yeah. it was a cool experience and um, and yeah quite a few of them uh, did join the church and um, so it was you know good experience for sure. That's it. So so once you graduated from you got the the scholarship to come here is did you guys meet right away or was that some no okay so tell us the story about how you met um 
so when Isaiah first came home from his mission, um, he had about a year. He came back. He came back to campus the same time I left Latie to go to BYU Provo. Mm, okay. So when I came home after winter uh, semester and I was going to attend BYU Hawaii Spring, um, one of my dear high school friends, Puole Olioli, mm-hmm. um, we were in the cultural hall at the Latie Steak Center and he was across the gym. This is so cheesy, but I can't. It is it is what it is. <laughs> he was across the gym and Puole and I were talking. I was like, who's that guy? And she's like, oh my goodness, that's Isaiah Walker. He lives across the street from you. And I had just come back from Provo, so I hadn't met him. And I was like, oh, I've never met him. She's like, oh my gosh, you have to meet him. And so we walk over and um, (laughs) it it was just like- Barry White music playing. (laughs) I can see it right now, like the whole gym. It was like like this electric current and it was just, we met and it was like, hi, hi. And it was just, yeah. Where have you been all my life? (laughs) Well, you know, she was also impressed that I was a- a, He was a sunbeam teacher. teacher for the- Little kids. In fact, Daniel James, I think, was in my yeah. class and a few Daniel other James. kids. And so that impressed her seeing me with five year olds teaching. Carrying a Sunbeams teacher's manual. Oh, like, yeah. oh I teach the Sunbeams. I'm like, oh. Um, you know, every time. Every time we met. And whether or not Isaiah likes to admit it, he went home to his house and told his roommate, What'd you tell your roommate? Uh, I think I may have met my future wife. So, so I, so you felt the same way fairly soon as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. But the road wasn't as smooth <laughs> as you would imagine after that. That was but just the meeting. It was we pretty met. smooth. I mean, yeah. We, yeah, it took a year and a half for us to, uh, to get married, but to get engaged. Again, to that's, that's the deal. As <laughs> I mentioned earlier, with reading the entire Book of Mormon, and so. Mm-hmm. We uh, <laughs> we had to a, read the entire book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, which is good. It's good that you know yeah. we took some advice. You know, long dating, short uh, engagement. Yeah. So we took that advice. Yeah. Well, and it's paid off, right? For so, sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you guys were both in school at the time uh, that you were dating. And yep. but you also studied some of the similar. Did you guys know when you first met that? I mean, because. You guys both do very similar things with the history of the Pacific. Tell everybody kind of what you studied while you were here. Um, I did Pacific Island studies and Isaiah did history. Um, And, you know, while we were dating, we would always talk about like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of a thing. And we actually took a history class together from like Cynthia Compton and Mm. we read the books together and we talk about it. And that was one of the things even when we were dating is we could always um, talk about our studies together, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your paper on? What's your paper on? And we would just read the book and bounce off ideas. And um, yeah, and that's something that throughout our courtship and then throughout our marriage has always been um, important to us. Mm -hmm. And and that we have that connection intellectually Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, when he was writing his book, I was reading his book and I could give him feedback and, um, you know, and he, yeah, vice versa. We could always just kind of support each other in our career pathways. Yeah, she likes to brag that she gave come up with the title of my book, which is true. Uh, <laughs> yes, I wrote a book. She gave you the title. Wait, I have it. Waves of Resistance. Okay. So she oh. came up with the name. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's super creative, by the way. I design books and I write books. And I when I saw that, I was like, OK, that is that is awesome. And it was, he came to me with this whole list of titles and I was like, no, none of those are good. Just call it waves of resistance. And he was like, what did you just say? That's it. That's it. <laughs> and he wrote it down and he was like, darn it. She got it. You know, it's one of those, like yeah. she got it first. So, well, that's, that's how, you know, it's the right thing. It's like a zinger. It's just like zing. And you're like, yep, that's it. That's it. I mean, but he wrote the book. All I did was like, Here's a title. So um, you're 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 part of the writing. You're part, and that's what, that, that I think that's what you just said is that you guys have been partners since the very beginning, you know, and we all play a part in that. And that's awesome that you were able to to support him that way. Yeah. And I think it's um, 
you know, because now everything Isaiah is doing in his book, it's me as a supporter, but a lot of people don't see Isaiah as my supporter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after when we were dating, our plan was always to um, continue our education. Mm -hmm. And it was don't get a real job, just keep going to school, stay poor, mm -hmm. and then we won't know what we're missing. So, you know, and, and when we got engaged, he promised my parents that I would graduate with my bachelor's from BYU Hawaii. And so, mm -hmm. You know, um, he graduated before me, but he lived up to that and supported me so I could finish my undergrad. Um, and then I supported him while he was doing his master's. And then, um, you know, two kids in tow or with kids in tow, we just kept going. Yeah. Um, but we couldn't have done that without having we were just partnership for sure. You know, we had two kids. Mm -hmm. We were in graduate school and it was, OK, you're in class. I have the kids. I'll ride the bike with the kids. You take the bike with no kids. We'll switch. Um, and uh, we found some of those calendars we had. And it's like every two or three hours, who has the kids and who's riding up to campus? And then this is your study time. You can take a nap here. Um, but yeah, good memories. Yeah. But it was it was always um, Isaiah's just always been a really great supporter of what I wanted to do and in my career choices and in my furthering my education. So, yeah, it's um I love that. It's a partnership. Yep. It, yeah. You're study buddies for life. <laughs> That's funny. Sometimes I say, let's turn it off. <laughs> let's turn it off. Right. No theoretical arguments in uh, marriage conversations. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so the interesting, okay. So tell us quickly the story about, you know, who, okay. How did the proposal go? Oh, right? we'll skip that story. Oh, <laughs> is that off limits? It wasn't very romantic. Yeah. It was uh, guys. Guys should always know the women like the story, right? So it's got to be a good story that you can tell for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> the marriage was better than the engagement, but you know we dated for so long, and it was just a matter of. And then for Isaiah, it was like when he joined the church, right? He had to read the whole Book of Mormon mm -hmm. and like know it's true. Patience. So yeah, patience. And after a year and a half of dating. I gave him an ultimatum and I said, <laughs> either we get married or I'm leaving on my mission. Ooh. And uh, yeah, so. So there's the proposal. The, yeah, so he proposed and he just uh, gave me the ring and said, do you want to get married? And it was as simple like that. And oh, you know what, Isaiah, it's perfect. It, it worked. Absolutely perfect. It, it got you the result anyway. So, right. sure. and you know, sometimes we focus on the wrong things. Like it always doesn't have to be the big to do. It's. It's more like that time we took to really get to know each other. I think yeah. that was more important. Yeah. I I <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things too that came up um, uh, when I was talking to you the other day, Isaiah, and I told you I'd bring this up, but I love that that you said that you you have a great love and passion for the water and Rebecca is more the land person. So talk a little bit about that. And like, obviously we talked a little bit about your um, you know, in the surfing and things like that. But Rebecca, why are you passionate about the land as well? So if you can both talk about that. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting though. Uh, recently at graduation, I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, Kai Fung gave a talk and uh, he shared a little bit of a story that, that I'd shared with him uh, that essentially I think Kind of, you know, as I was talking earlier about about my desire to be a professional surfer, I really abandoned that uh, to do other things that I felt the Lord was directing me to, which was first serving a mission and then completing school. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool because in the long run, what happened was, uh, you know, I ended up going to graduate school in Santa Barbara. Uh, and while Rebecca was studying anthropology, I was studying mostly US history, world history, and Hawaiian history. But when you when you get a PhD in history, you know, you pick a dissertation topic and that's where your, you know, your personal research, uh, you focus for the last, you know, part of your, your graduate experience. And, um, and I decided to tell the history of Hawaii through the lens of surfing is like the vehicle for, for talking about that. And so, so tech, I mean, my book really isn't a history of surfing. It's a history of Hawaii as told through the lens of surfing is kind of like the vehicle for, for talking about Hawaii's history. And, um, 
And so, yeah. yes, I'm always, so in the end, like I, I ended up, you know, getting a, a career that's based on um, really that is, you know, related to my passion for surfing. And, and, you know, I really do recognize the Lord's hand in blessing me with that because it was, you know, essentially a very cooler version of the dream that I had earlier. Right. I mean, I was, I was pretty good at surfing, but I wasn't, I probably wouldn't have lasted that long, you know, as a pro mm -hmm. surfer, I wasn't, a, you know, a Kelly Slater or anything like that. Um, <laughs> so, so this way, like my career in my profession that is related to surfing uh, is much more longevity, um, a lot more influence. And it's just so much cooler than what I, you know, had in mind for myself previously. Uh, in fact, today, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of am the expert on the topic, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, yeah. the Associated Press, I'm working with them right now. We're doing a story about surfing history and Hawaii and the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, surfing has recently become an Olympic sport. And so it's really cool that I still am able to, um, to you know, that the surfing is, uh, is a topic that I've become kind of a professional at. Um, and sometimes even I'll, I'll be a commentator at some of the professional surfing competitions and it allows me to sort of be in that scene and uh, just in a very different realm. And it's very fun. So, so yeah, the ocean has always been my thing since I was a kid. My, you know, this goes way back. Uh, my grandmother, Abigail Kalani, grew up in Waikiki and, you know, she used to surf. And mm. so it's something that I've inherited from the Hawaiian side of my family and so still, you know, it's um, something that, you know, all of my kids, we surf together uh, and um, it's just a part of who I am. And it's funny and ironic, I suppose, that my last name is Walker. But when I was a kid, I broke my leg. <laughs> yeah, so, so I have like, I, <laughs> I'm not like really, I don't like walking a lot or hiking. Yeah. So I ride a skateboard and stuff because, uh, you know, I'm a little off balance because of all these bone breaks <laughs> oh when I was a kid. Um, but Rebecca loves, um, you know, as an anthropologist, she she works for Hawaiian Islands Lands Trust, and she's always like in the mountains and um, taking tours for uh, the community into these, you know, sacred sites, these heiau. Mm -hmm. There's a heiau. She can talk more about it, but uh, Mauna Wila Heiau in Haula, she's managed that for many years now, and does a really good job at it. But it, but it involves being up in the mountains and on land, so we're kind of like that. Um, <laughs> The flower. Oh. What is it? The, the nalpaka. The nalpaka. You know the mo'oleloi, the story of the nalpaka where we're not separated, but mm -hmm. there were, um, uh, you know, a, a boyfriend and girlfriend, and it was that, like, love that wasn't allowed to mm -hmm. be. And so they were separated, and there's half the flower, which many of you are familiar with at Temple Beach, right? That mm -hmm. white half flower on the nalpaka, and then there's a mountain variety. It's yellow and it has sharper leaves, but it's the other half of that mm. flower, right? Anyway, that's what he was alluding to. But, um, you know, when I was in high school, we would always, we liked to mountain bike up to Laie Falls. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've just always been more of a hiker and I'm, I'm not a good swimmer and there are monsters in the ocean. <laughs> and, um, you know, my, I consider my greatest, uh, not greatest, but a good thing I did is like, at least my children don't have my same, like phobias. phobias of the ocean. And, but so that's their thing. Um, but I love to watch them. And, you know, I always knew in marrying brother Walker, Isaiah, that I would always have to live by the ocean. So even in going to graduate school, um, UC Santa Barbara is a great school, but it has surf. You know? <laughs> yes, I know. I, I noticed you guys went to another place that's close yeah. to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't even apply inland. Yeah. Like, People get island fever and he gets landlocked. So, you know, but I can't complain. So it's, um, yeah, yeah, always by the ocean. So, yeah. I love one one of the things, Isaiah, that you said too, is that, um, you know, because I took your class, I took the history of the Pacific, which um, was fascinating to me. I, I flunked all my history classes. I think I told you that in high school. But <laughs> um, I loved your class because you gave such a perspective um, to all the different cultures, right? And how they, they work together. And also it opened up my eyes to, I've never even thought about the history of the surfing, 
right? And to seeing the rights and just the way that you that you taught about that. And the other thing that you brought up that I loved is, and this comes up a lot in this podcast, to believe it, believe it or not, is that life never turns out the way that we think it's going to turn out. But it's great that you can still keep your passion in sharing it with the world on just a different level. And I know that you, both of you, do a lot of community service, right? Like, I I know in class you shared that you were working um, with pro surfers and that you have all these connections and in, in, in coaching them and helping them on different projects that they have. So what a great testament that, you know, just because we at a certain age, think that our life's going to go a certain way. And that's what the whole Kelly, right, is navigating that um, that path in our lives that sometimes God has a greater plan for us if we can just listen and be in tune enough to go, right, so how can you marry both of those those things, that, you know, that you're passionate about, but also you now got into education? Um, and both of you guys, so let's go a little bit quick into the San Diego, I mean, not San Diego, Santa you served a mission in San Diego, but you went to Santa Barbara um, and followed each other there to get your master's and PhD. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had earned a, a master's degree at UH Manoa and then went on to a PhD in Santa Barbara. And so Rebecca, uh, we both went went there. We already had our two, for two oldest kids. And, and then Rebecca got into the anthropology department there at UC Santa Barbara. So we're you know, in graduate school at the same time. And she ended up finishing her master's degree at the same time that I finished my PhD. That's awesome. And then, oh, go ahead. I think, um, you know, those moments in between those programs are something mm -hmm. that like we reflect back on. Like when I was, when we were finishing our bachelor's and you're applying to grad school and you don't really know if you're gonna get in mm -hmm. or, you know, and then you're applying to like your master's program into your PhD program, those moments of in between, mm -hmm. Um, where like we, here we are, we had one kid and we didn't know where we were going and you just keep praying and you go to the temple and, you know, it was in the ocean that Isaiah would usually get like, I mean the temple too, but in the ocean, like his inspiration or that reassurance or, um, yeah, of just like, it's going to come just be the clarity. Yeah. The clarity and, and, um, that faith, those were leaps of faith to like kind of put everything on hold and just, um, and we, yeah, and it was. And I was grateful for, you know, Rebecca, she is a, uh, you know, strong supporter and I'm kind of a homebody. Encourager. <clears throat> so I, when I got into UC Santa Barbara, I also got accepted at UH Manoa and, and they were going to pay, you know, they offered to pay for my schooling. And I was like, oh, let's just stay here. And then she was like, no, let's go to the better school. Like it'll work mm -hmm. out better in the long run. And so, you know, I was glad that <clears throat> I had a supportive companion who uh, gave me that extra uh, boost of confidence to get outside of my comfort zone and leave Hawaii. Yeah, and I, and I can tell that those leap of faiths were difficult at times uh, for you guys to make. Um, which is usually for most people, right? When we don't see the future and we don't wear, know where we're being led to. Um, uh oh, somebody's getting a call. Oh, <laughs> that's me. Sorry. Stop, <laughs> stop. stop. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to have to just hang up. There we go. Um, so, yeah. And so, and so then you guys got your education. At what point did you decide that you were going to come back here? What brought you back to, to be in Hawaii? Both of our families live here. My parents, my uh, sister, I had one, or my sisters were kind of, we all ended up back home. Um, and Isaiah's family was all here in Hawaii. And we knew, um, we knew this is where we wanted to be, but it was also that like, well, if Heavenly Father, if that's where you need us and it works out, you know, mahalo, like we're willing, we were there. Um, but then also we were willing to go where you needed us to go. Right. Mm -hmm. There's that, like, we wanted this, but if it had turned, you know, wherever the Lord had kind of impressioned us, I think we definitely would have gone. Um, we were just fortunate that our goals lined up with his goals. Um, or what he needed us for. You know, it's kind of tricky too. I don't think a lot of people know this, but you know, just because you finish up your PhD doesn't really land you a job mm -hmm. uh, in academia. And it's actually 
kind of tricky. I mean, there's a lot of universities around the world, uh, and but there's only so many spots. You, know, you can't just create mm -hmm. a spot out of nowhere for someone. Uh, so when we first, when I first finished and we moved back, um, you know, there weren't any openings here on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky that there was a position in Hilo where I grew up. So I worked at UH Hilo before mm -hmm. coming here. And then, um, you know, when the time was right, there were there were two professors that uh, left BYU Hawaii from the history department and went to BYU in Provo. It opened an opportunity for me to apply. And I was just really grateful that, you know, I ended up getting a position here on campus at BYU Hawaii. And it was, you know, speaking of the mission of the university, um, you know, now since we've been, you know, both of us work here and teach mm -hmm. classes and, and being a graduate of BYU Hawaii and alumni, just really, you know, really, you know, we see the the value of of the whole vision and the mission of of our school and how powerful it is. You know, and I'm I'm learning now, especially now I'm um, my new position, which you know I could explain mm -hmm. in a minute, but just realizing the profound and prophetic nature of it, like no other church school has the kind of mission, you know, prophetic mission that ours does. So it's for, for people, some people that may not know what that mission is, uh, how can, can you explain that to them? And, and the cool thing, okay, so the cool thing about this story is it goes beyond just, uh, you know, most people talk about David O. McKay. So David mm -hmm. O. McKay is the founder of, of BYU Hawaii, and he had this vision. What What's really cool is that there were like many other individuals that were influential, uh, you know, prophets and apostles that had almost the exact same experience. So it goes back to one of the first guys is uh, George Q. Cannon. George Q. Cannon comes to Hawaii. He's one of the, in the first group of missionaries that come to Hawaii in 1850. And when he gets here, there's some struggles, some hardships because, um, you know, the only people who speak English are other missionaries and uh, whalers. And, and the whalers at that time were kind of like pirates. You know, they didn't really have much interest. Neither did some of the other churches have interest in joining our church. So a lot of them were ready to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, George Q. Cannon has this, this inspiration where he, he, you know, has this revelation that the, the people that they should be teaching is the native people in Hawaii. And that, you know, he has this vision that they're chosen people from the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different perspective from some of the other missionaries from other churches at that time who kind of saw them as, you know, savage or that mm. they were unequal and they needed to be kind of uplifted. Whereas this was a very different perspective of, oh, wow, these are the chosen people and we just need to share the gospel with them. And I think because of that perspective, the church becomes very um, appealing and there's a lot of uh, Hawaiians who convert to the church. Um, of course, there's many other people in the story uh, that George Buchanan interacts with, Jonathan Napella and many others. But <clears throat> that is very similar to the, to what happens to Joseph F. Smith, who comes as a missionary a, year, a few years later, where he has that same sort of revelation, that same feeling of the importance of the people here in Hawaii. And then David O. McKay in 1921 comes to BYU, well, it wasn't BYU yet, but he comes to Laie. And while he's here in Laie, uh, he attends an elementary school morning, you know, opening, um, opening exercise or whatever. And then he has this same vision where he's like, oh my goodness, like there's something awesome about this place. And it was the people, right? It was, mm -hmm. it was the people in Laie, he sees in these children a reflection of the entire world, right? He sees, mm -hmm. you know, you, at the time in Laie, you still had sugarcane plantation going on. So you had, you know, the diversity of people from Asia and the Pacific related to the plantation and to- And there really wasn't anything here. That's what the most amazing thing about, if, if you come to La Ie now, I mean, it's like, you know, it's gorgeous and it's beautiful and it's luscious, but all there was was a temple here. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, which, like, which, yeah, which is amazing. Which it's amazing. Which makes a whole lot of sense too, for, I think for yeah. a lot of people, because it was like, wow, you know- um, In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of a sugarcane field, like, wow. And, and a lot of that goes back to, of course, that, that vision that Joseph F. Smith has. And so there's these very profound experiences that very, you know, these key individuals have in Hawaii, in Laie, from our, from our church that, uh, that show that there's something really sacred about mm -hmm. this place. 
Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't realize is that it took 30 years for David O. McKay's vision to come to fruition. Yeah. A lot of that may have been, you know, he, he was an apostle at the time when in, in, in 1921. He didn't really have, you know, the, the driver's seat yet, I suppose. But can you imagine having an experience and then holding on to that for 30 years? One of the first things he does when he becomes the prophet and president of, our, of the church is he you know, makes that dream come to fruition. Mm -hmm. He really says something, 30 years holding on to something, mm -hmm. enough so that it's like top on your agenda when you are in that position to make that change, um, says something about the profoundness of that experience in his um, mm -hmm. in his time. So, so again, he's so excited about um, opening the school and what it does, and I think a lot of people don't realize, a lot of times, I don't think everyone really grasp the magnitude of this experience. Mm -hmm. It's not just about Laie. Mm -hmm. This is very important, I think, the point to make. It's about the church relationship in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, David O. McKay is known as the president who really shifts the focus of the church to become an international church. Mm. Um, and, and it really is this emphasis in a global church. And we get the concepts of Zion is wherever you live, right? Whereas you know, mm -hmm. earlier years, it was sort of like everyone has to gather to the same place. Um, David O. McKay has this very profound shift in our perspective of Zion, and it's more like this concept of the global church. And yeah. his bring, bring him here, right? Yeah, bring but him his, here. But his experience here in La mm -hmm. is what triggers that, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then the the building of the school. Sorry, am I talking too much? Uh, the, I'm, I'm part Portuguese and I'm a pro oh, professor, so that you know. I know what Portuguese means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so, but uh, David O. McKay, like, um, he, you know, BYU Hawaii benefits greatly from that vision, but so does the church from from that mm -hmm. whole shift in in perception of the church uh, as role in the in the rest of the world, and so it's a real blessing. Uh, you know, BYU Hawaii still living up to that legacy of of it being an international um campus of of you know promoting peace and and international um brotherhood and leadership and mm -hmm. all these values that uh are are real and and it's and it's cool to be a part of that experience and to be part of the that whole vision um of, of not just david o mckay but many other of his predecessors yeah I, I, oh go ahead I feel like I see glimpses of it in my students. Mm -hmm. Like every semester, I mean, we've he's taught we've taught for like I've taught you now for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. And every semester when you get a new batch of students and you look into their faces and you have these conversations, um, I feel a responsibility because you know, we're educating not just students, but like brothers and sisters in Zion, like members of the gospel who are going to go out to back to their homes and to many places throughout the world. And they are. And so often they become leaders. Well, leaders of your home or leaders in your community or leaders in your church or leaders, you know, wherever you are in your work. And so I feel that like when I get this new batch of students every semester and it's like, okay, we're going to talk about, I mean, for my, what I teach, you know, it's, we're going to talk about culture and we're going to talk about people and we're going to talk about um, how we can be better people. And, you know, in the discipline of anthropology, I think of it as, you know, in trying to get people to be less discriminatory and to be more kind and loving and caring, they're all Christ-like attributes too. Mm -hmm. right? Of just loving more, um, being kinder, and recognizing that that's our role in the world. Um, so I think in teaching every semester, we get to see piece of that vision in the new faces we get every semester. And I've loved it when students who I've taught from around the world, um, and if I see them on social media, or, you know, and I can just be like, yay, you know, it's just, it feels, it's an, it's, it brings me joy. Oh, and ab absolutely. I 100% agree. I think we talk about that a lot here in the Ho'okele because we have a lot of students that work here. 
And I feel exactly the same way um, because I, I was just talking to a couple of the students the other day. I said, you guys are going to be bishops. I, I already see it. You know what I mean? You, you, you can see them as the leaders that they're going to be. And, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when you were young, you probably didn't see that you'd be in this position now as a VP, you know, but, you know, they don't see that when they're young and they, they don't see that journey, but God knows that, right. And knows where they need to be. But, and I love that you recognize that and you playing a part in that, in educating and being a part of this vision, both of you guys being professors, professors and, and being able to have an influence on these students and and seeing them because we do. This is a very diverse. What do did, what did they I think they said? Fifty some odd countries, right exactly. now. Yeah. Oh, right Seven, now. Right well, now. Yeah. Is that, I think right now it's like 50, 50 different countries or something, and we've got only three thousand students. So it's a very small campus, but um, uh, what a blessing to be able to be a part of that. And how does that really? Um, influence the way that you that you interact and in, when you teach the students knowing that you're part of that well the cool thing about our campus that we didn't get at at our other schools honestly is that it's not i mean it's a because of the nature of the makeup of student body it's oftentimes that students know more about a particular thing than we the teachers mm. do, right and allowing that space for during you know class conversation and discussion um, you know, I, I was teaching a class this, this last semester and we we're talking about uh, Ifonga, which is a, you know, Samoan ritual of, mm -hmm. of forgiveness. And uh, anyway, and this, this girl from Samoa had much more insight to this practice than I did. And she shared a personal experience of her family and how they went through this experience. And I mean, she knew much more about it than I did. And it, it was great for students to learn from each other and we see it all the time and i think that's mm -hmm. an invaluable part of yeah. the experience here in the classroom at BYU Hawaii that's a yeah. great that's a great insight to you know that you also are open as professors to 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 using or utilizing i should say the yeah. students experience to add to the richness of the education that they're getting in the rooms I love that. So you guys are now like in a whole new chapter of life. Like you just barely, what well, was yesterday, your first day of, of work? For some yes. people that may not know, you you just got appointed the vice president, the VP of academics. Tell Correct. us kind of what how that was for you and how did you feel about that? <laughs> uh, well, I, something that I was kind of avoiding for most of my career here, no, I'm, just kidding. Uh, I what I meant to say is that I really <laughs> loved what I did, as, you know, teaching. You know, and I mm -hmm. I loved um, just being involved with research and and writing and teaching. Um, and then you know, just this opportunity where I was um, you know hired in this position to be the VP of Academics. Um, yeah, it's a real honor and a privilege. It's not something that I aspired to, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But it did seem like it was one of those experiences that were, you know, when there's sort of some divine intervention, I guess, mm -hmm. and things fell into place and, and, and in my life that seemed to be directing us in that way. Um, but, you know, we also have a new administration that, um, that I've, that I see is very kind of aligned with some of my perspectives as well. And um, yeah, I was just, you know, uh, I was honored to, to, you know, be hired in this position and I'm literally just still there's boxes around yeah, me. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I was going to tell everybody mm -hmm. that we were in your office the other day and you got boxes everywhere and you're up against a wall. You're crammed in this little place. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, no, but, but uh, John Bell, who was the former AV, uh, academic vice president uh, was amazing. And yeah. I was very fortunate that he took the time to to spend with me. So we, I spent the last month basically mm -hmm. shadowing him and very kind person who cared a lot about the university mm -hmm. um, and did a, a lot of work to make sure that there were, you know, that this canoe is steering in the right direction mm -hmm. and it made it much easier for me to just get on board 
and ride along with the wave, you know. And um, but but it's exciting. I think really, um, I think BYU Hawaii is at a really cool kind of place right now, and I, I foresee a um, you know a lot of cool things happening. And, and I do. I keep thinking of a canoe um, as a metaphor uh, mm-hmm. for the campus and. You know, I think we've got some great voyages in front of us for sure. And so what do you think, Rebecca? How do you feel about everything? Um, For the last couple of years, I've kind of done a lot of work um, in my own career with like um, cultural resource management or vahikukuna stewardship. And Mm -hmm. so I've been gone a lot and Mm -hmm. I'm here and there and everywhere. And, you know, Isaiah has been my like biggest supporter Mm because we've just tag teaming the five kids, you know, it was always, okay, you here, I'm there kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had made a decision to kind of step back and turn that position over to someone else. And when I made that decision and everything lined up to, for me to kind of step away and then Isaiah got this position Mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's, you don't always know what's being, what you're being prepared for. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I'm just so excited to be able to support him in this. Mm. Uh, and it just comes from like having him as such a good support. So cheesy. We're, so, <laughs> we're really not this cheesy. Um, we we have, love cheesy, just so you know. We'll take cheesy yeah. every day. Oh, but it's true. So I am just excited to be able to support him in this. And yeah. I feel, um, I feel like I mean we're excited. I think both of us are really excited just to like be part of some really great things that I think of what's coming, you know, and. Um, this place has been so special to us and influenced us in so many ways that for, I think for our family to be able, and sharing Isaiah, I guess, our family to be able to give back is the least we could do. It's just like, all right, if we can keep supporting this mission, if we can help build, if we can, you know, in whatever ways, um, it seemed that like, just feel blessed and like excited and grateful and, yeah. uh, yeah. See the, see the hand of the Lord in all things to bring you yeah. to this new adventure, right? Sure. And um, speaking of which, I wanted to surprise you earlier, but I have I have a little surprise because sure. um, I got a hold of one of your old professors, oh. Paul Spickard, right? Oh, wow. Okay, and but I have to say he couldn't come live, so he did a little he did a little recording for you, but. Oh, wow. um, that I'm going to share. I know it's so fun. We love to surprise people here. Hold on. Let me uh, change this out so I can oh my gosh. bring him on. Hold on. Oh, he's so, he was so sweet to talk to. And then I'm going to share something else that he said to you about, but I'll go ahead and share this with you. Aloha Isaiah and to uh, Re- Rebecca and the kids and your mother and our, our our mutual friends and those friends that I don't know because you have been cultivating them all these years at BYU Hawaii. Um, when I learned that you were going to be uh, the vice president for academics, I rejoiced for uh, my former university and for you and for the people of Hawaii. Um, I, I am so excited about uh, what the future holds for you. I am busting over with pride that I know you. Um, and I feel not a bit different about you than I did uh, the first week that I knew you when you were an undergraduate at, at BYU Hawaii. Um, congratulations. Kuha heo. Ah, there you go. Well, I know he was such a sweet man. Um, oh, it's... Uh, but he shared something with me that, um, and you know, it's funny, I, I do this kind of interviewing stuff all the time and it's always the stuff that's not recorded that's shared that I'm like, oh, I should have grabbed that. But he said there was no other man that he would see as a perfect fit for where you are right now. And I just, I, I was really grateful that he shared that with me because, um, you know, he, he worked here for what, eight years, I think it was? Yeah, eight years, and then he spent some time in San Diego. Or, uh, he's now a professor at the Santa Barbara 
UC Santa Barbara. He's 71. He won't retire because he says he just, what is he going to do with his life? You know, <laughs> but he's um, such a positive influence to all of his students. Talk about Paul Spickard. Um, so Paul Spickard was a history professor here at BYU Hoy in the you know 1990s. He's had such a profound ability to motivate and inspire students. Mm. I mean, some, here's some of his students, uh, myself, Chad Ford, who's a professor mm -hmm. here now, Kali Fermantis, who's a professor here now, uh, Matt Kester, who was uh, in our archives and now is writing movies and TV shows for Hollywood. And the list goes on and on and yeah, on. Nani, he very cool. Anyway, he goes on and on. Um, so, I mean, he's I, I've always sort of aspired to be as good as him and when it comes to um, believing in students mm -hmm. and and I think this is good advice for for students as well as follow professors who believe in you mm. because that's where you'll find success right um, so after he was at BYU Hawaii he left and he went to other schools and he ended up at UC Santa Barbara and I ended up following him there because he was such an inspiration and he was so, I mean, the guy was amazing as in his profession. I mean, published many, many books, was very active in, in academics and in, in teaching and in, he won all kinds of awards. And so I just wanted to be around him. But he, I mean, he believed in what I was doing when no one else did. Mm. So like for me to propose, I wanna write a dissertation on surfing in Hawaiian history you know, he had to go to bat for me to his colleagues who th honestly thought, was well, this really a serious topic? Mm -hmm. Which, um, cool story, full circle, after I finished it and my book came out and, and the New York Times did a story on my mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. And then like in the newsletter for our history department at UC Santa Barbara, I was like on the front page and how cool I was. And I just felt like, how ironic that was. <laughs> yes. So it's not everyone, only Paul believed in it, right? Spickard. Um, so some good advice to, to students, um, follow professors who believe in you and yeah. that belief can carry you through, you know, through through even questioning yourself. We, we all have our insecurities and our doubts, you know, like, you know, I was just a surfer from Hilo who, just wasn't much of an academic when I was younger. And it was from people like Paul and other professors who I looked up to and aspired to be like. And then, you know, of course I had to work hard, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so you, you gotta put in the work too. Yeah. So you Well, do and that's been a thing too that we found in this podcast is a lot of the people who have stayed here and given back to the university really were not very academic at first. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of funny that that what's brought them here, and it, again, it's kind of the Lord's hand that they they come here, and the Lord goes, "Yeah, let me see what I'm going to make out of you," you know, and have you give back to this university and help. And I also have to say, with Paul, uh, my sister's oldest daughter just got accepted to UCSB, right, for or mm -hmm. Santa Barbara, and he was like, "Have her come in, tell her, tell her you sent me." And Not so, really. yeah, I you know, amen to that. I thought that was really sweet of him to, to, to say that, but he wanted to be live, but he had other plans tonight. So okay. you'll have to I just want to add, um, yeah. you know, that side of like students to look for those professors, but also for those of us who teach, no matter where we are, mm -hmm. you know, the power of that influence of just believing, being that mm -hmm. person who can believe in students, mm -hmm. I can go far. And you just never know where that, you know, so there's the two sides, like mm -hmm. students look for that professor and then it's like, okay, those of us who are teachers, how can we be that person who does the encouraging? Exactly. Right? And Paul's so amazing. That was a really That was a special. real treat there. Thank you. Becky, thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I really, I feel bad. I, I reached out to him today and I, I accidentally, and I had to call the, this college and everything to get a hold of him and then email and he responded. Anyway, it was, it was really, really sweet. He just has he he has a really soft spot spot for Hawaii and for BYU Hawaii yeah, and um, sure. and so yeah, so it was really great to get in touch with him. But um, well, I want to thank you guys for I, this. Look how fast this hour went. <laughs> we could talk for another hour. 
<laughs> and it was so, and we're actually in the same ward and we have never really gotten to, to know each other. But, um, but I want to thank you guys for spending the time today. I know there's so much more to your story and so much more that you've done in the communities and that you continue to do in the communities and make an influence in the students. And I, I'm 100% confident that what you're, where you're at right now and what you're doing is exactly where you're supposed to be um, in helping people. And I th thank you so much for the advice that you've, you've given the students, mm -hmm. but also the story that you shared with, um, with the people who are watching. I just wanted to really quickly bring on a couple of, um, let's see. So do you guys know Greg? Greg, how do you say this last name? Heels, Tibble. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, brother yeah. and sister Walker, for sharing your story. I like your experiences of walking by faith. It's great to know that we are not the only ones confused of what the future holds for us. <laughs> you are a great example. I see life. Uh, I see a life of faith. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Greg, for for saying that. Uh, we you might have to read this one. Tavita says, "Mahalo, Nui." Isaiah and Rebecca for the awesome historical context of CCH and BYUH. Aww. Yay. And then Andy, do you guys know Andy? Andy Meta? Uh, yeah, oh, Addy. Addy. Oh, Addy, sorry. I yes. know I, One of our great there's students. my dyslexia. No, no, you're good. And and Maria piped in. Awesome, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> I may have met her before. And Lay, of course, Lay says, I know Daniel James, but that must be It dates us because Daniel James is a grown adult with children, and Isaiah was his sunbeam teacher. So, oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, that is so awesome. Well, this has been a great, a great time getting to know you guys. Um, thank you again. Any thank last, you. last parting words at all before we send you off to your, your weekend of bliss? Of bliss, <laughs> yeah, of no school, unpacking, and yeah, yeah. Um, just you know, thank you and all to all of our alumni out there. Just want to say a big aloha to you and mahalo um, for you know still holding BYU Hawaii in your heart. And I think that's another really cool thing about BYU Hawaii. It does really linger with you, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't feel the same sort of affinity to a lot of my other schools, right? So at BYU Hawaii, there's always a special place and a memory and so um, aloha to all of you and grateful. And I, I just, you know, hope to represent uh, the school well and uh, in, in my new position. And I'm grateful to, to, to be here on the show. Awesome. Thank you, Becky. Yes. Thank you guys so much. And uh, all right, we'll talk to you in just one second. I'm going to, so we want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. Um, for another week of our Aloha Friday. And if you don't know about where to find us, you can go to our YouTube channel at the Ho'okele, BYU Hawaii Ho'okele. And it has all of our shows there. If you want to connect or if you want to be on the show or have somebody else that you think that would be awesome to tell their stories, it's so important that we tell our stories of um, you know, how we get here and what have we done with the education and the mission and the vision of this beautiful university here so you can go to the whole uh to ohana.byuh.edu you can also email us at alumni at byuh.edu and we've just got some exciting things that are going on we've also i just want to remind everybody i'm going to be doing a little commercial here in the next week or so with all the benefits for what is what are the benefits that you get for being an alumni here at byu hawaii and so stay tuned for that um, if you have any questions or would like to reach out to us or how, let us know how we can support you. Please email us at the alumni at byuh.edu. And thank you guys and have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.